As I was editing this episode, a horrendous event took place in Manchester, UK. From myself, James, and John, we want to send our deepest heartfelt condolences to the families, friends, and anybody else affected by this atrocious act. Holocron of the Will stands with Manchester. Chisa, Picha, Kuanki Chubaka. Only archives hold a great many secrets. It is true. Beyond this door lies the Holocron Vault. The Holocrons contain the most closely guarded secrets of the Jedi Order. Oh man, this this ale is to die for. This is this Alderanian ale. You know, one of the one of these uh, one of these uh, uh, servants who have brought this to me. This thing is fantastic. Yeah, this palace is very very beautiful. I can't can't express how how nice it is here. Um, Absolutely fantastic. It is so beautiful. It's a much. A much more welcome place than that cave we were in last week. You know, when we finally made it back to the shuttle with that, uh, with that, um, it, you know, it chasing right behind us. With, you know, I keep oh, my, the Rancor? Yeah, yeah the you were, Rancor. For some reason, I have you're, Sarlacc you're, in my head. But yeah, with the Rancor right behind us, you know, and just like before running into the cave, James was a little behind us. Started getting worried, James. Hey, I was catching up. Yeah, you were. Uh, I was trying. <laughs> I, you I left was... me carrying all the equipment, so. Hey, well, uh, you got hey, a little slack you, here. You, you drew the shortest lightsaber. Yeah, I know. I well, know. Well, <laughs> at, at least we got the we got the new mixing board now. I went back to that flying dude on Tatooine. I got a new one. It's all written in English. It should be no problems. So. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Right. Well, we should probably explain where we're at. Um. Oh yeah. We were. Uh, for our listeners, um, we're graciously uh, invited by His uh, Excellency the Bail Organa, uh, Senator or well, former Senator of Alderaan. Now he's just the uh, the consort to the Queen here. Um, and uh, something big going on. Um, he just arrived. We were at um, the uh, Rebel base a little bit ago, and. Uh, Organa has uh, told us, uh, you know, briefed us about what's what's been happening, and he, he told us about this Imperial Weapons Station. Did you guys hear about this? Yeah. Um, he like, was... the, like he, I, I know James was uh, kind of still tired from all that running, and he might have been napping during the briefing. <laughs> yeah, you may have to catch me up on this. I'm kind of, I think I missed all the news this time. But what um, is this about a, st- what, a new end? It is a, station? What's going on? Uh, it is an orbital battle station with oh. immense firepower. I'm talking huge. Um, now, we've, like, like, now we've seen orbital platforms before. Yeah, what are we but talking about? Like, something that's even larger than those? Like a big I'm space station? Something. I'm talking oh. something about the size of a small moon, perhaps no. with a width of 160 kilometers. Are you kidding really? me? Yeah, How with a how could they build something that big? Slave labor and droids. It's the Empire. They're monsters, so they can, you know... When you have enslaved countless planets, you can you can do that type of stuff, I guess. That's why that is, that is the true. rebels have... Uh, but it's a, it's, um, it's a weapon station. It's a, For what? Is oh, this yeah, for, like, space battles? What are they doing with this thing? I mean, if it's, um, well, if it's an uh, orbital, is it just sitting in place? Uh, no, it's moved. it's a mobile battle station. It has a hyperdrive. Really? Yeah, so this, wow. this space station can be fully mobile and deadly. Um, that's crazy. 160 sounds, kilometers that's a little, wide. Uh, with the that's a little crazy, yeah. Insane. Well, why don't you tell us more about this thing? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I have here on my uh, dossier that the Organa gave us. 
it appears that the these are part of from plans that we've got from other rebel spies. Um, we don't have the actual technical plans, but we do have a bunch of information on it. Um, the Death Star has code name. Death it has like fifteen thousand turbo laser batteries. 768 tractor beam emplacements, 2,500 laser cannons and ion cannons, with a crew of over between 1.1 million to 1.2 million total. Holy cow. How how has nobody learned about this yet? How have they been able to build this without anybody finding out? Well... Talking with some other people from the Rebellion, um, we think it was built over Geonosis. Uh, that, that rebel extremist Saw Gerrera was chasing shadows and stuff a few years ago. The Empire wiped out the entire Geonosian civilization, completely exterminating the bugs. Yeah, I think so, I heard something uh, about that. Some kind of a gas attack. I think it was found by Saw yeah. Gerrera in... I think it I think was Phoenix. I heard a rumor that it was with the, uh, the the Phoenix Squadron. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Honestly, I thought that was just rumor. I thought, you know, Saul was again chasing those shadows. Because, you know, we've it, heard how it was just extremely God. I thought he was just making this up. I thought it was... I had no fake. idea this was real. Yeah. Um... Uh, it's, it's real, and it's deadly, and we have no clue where it's at now in the galaxy. We last heard mm. reports that it, was, that it was at Scarif. Since then, we don't know where it could be, be anywhere. Really? Yes. Um, hello, listeners. You're uh, joining us here on All Around. You're listening to Holocron of the Wills with myself, John, and with me we have Lance and James. Howdy. Hello. Yes, <laughs> as... Uh, you heard us talk, you can obviously tell what our subject for today is, and you guessed it, we are talking about the Death Star. Not just the Death Star, but the second Death Star, you know? The one type of Star Wars vehicle that pretty much has been... Uh, yeah, I just got tongue-tied there. Lance edit that out. <laughs> Alright, just leave <laughs> a pause and continue. Yeah, um... The one Star Wars, one of the few Star Wars vehicles that have a, damn it, I can't get my words together. (laughs) One of the most, I, yeah, one of the most iconic Star Wars set locations and space stations in all of pop culture. That was a real big mouthful. Anyway, uh, (laughs) we're going to be talking about the Death Star 1 and the Death Star 2, and uh, we got a great have a great discussion about them. Uh, we're going to be looking into some stuff from canon and from stuff from Legends because uh, there w- there was a book a few years ago that was the Death Star instructional manual, which I don't know if you guys ever read that a few years ago. It was no, kinda, actually, it was I didn't see it. Um, and it got into like the full like it was like a car manual with the Death Star. Mm, that would be so we're gonna, hilarious. We're going to talk about that, even though you know parts of it. Probably not gonna. You know, we'll get some story of pride and keep, but you know we don't really care. It's, it's all, it's all fun. And who really, um, the amount of turbo lasers or the amount of this type of thing that was on the desktop probably isn't that important of a detail when you're looking at the big grand picture of things. No, but but it gives us um, an idea of the 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 strength and power that this thing uh, basically had as it was approaching a planet. And I think I think that's something that seemed to almost be missing in the first movie. I mean, you knew the planet destruction ray, but you didn't actually understand how powerful this thing was, even without that ray. Oh yeah, that's what I loved about Rogue One, when you see in uh, the Death Star arrive at Jeddah and it's annihilation how how it blocks out the sun Mm. and Mm -hmm. then it's Scarif when it it, it appears there, you just get this sense of Red and that beautiful shot in Rogue One with um, where the Death Star is coming through, um, like in the cl- you see it in the clouds of Scarif, 
it's just yeah, beautiful. And it's, yeah, and it's and upside down terrifying. almost. That the it looks like it's upside down, but it does. It I guess in space that's uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's no upside matter. down in yeah. space, but if you and it, that was one one other thing that I, I really liked about that shot was and even in the trailer when you see it kind of like rotating. You know, I never really thought like, oh, that would be how like it would, you know you would move to position something like that because you always see it with the dough with the dish, you know, on the the the, the northern top hemisphere, side, the, top, the northern yeah. hemisphere of it. You ever think about it being upside down or sideways or or what have you? It's just insane. Is that some of those shots with the Death Star in Rogue One were breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Gareth, when you put the dish on mm-hmm. and you see the, the Star Destroyer is to scale. Yeah, and that's not even it, to scale. They're still away from the dish, and that's what's sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's... Right. It's a lot. And really, George Lucas putting the first Death Star in the, the very first Star Wars movie, and then you know bringing it, the idea of this superpower battle station, super weapon... Uh, and for the the final chapter in the original trilogy, Return of the Jedi, it really started this trend that Star Wars has with super weapons. Like, if you ever, if anyone ever has, you know, gone online after the Force Awakens, people started complaining. Oh, of course they have to have another super weapon. Yeah. Which, you know, in Force Awakens, it's Star Killer Base, but it's, you know, if I could, I can't even count on both my hands all the different types of super weapons that are in the Star Wars universe yeah I mean, from Le- right. or from Legends yeah. you go back to those 90s books and that was all all the authors would write about you had the the Sun Crusher from the Jedi Academy uh, trilogy mm-hmm. you had the, I think it was the Eye of Palpatine yeah I think that's yeah. the one that had the Death Star type laser on it but it was um, it was yeah, a battle dark cruiser saber. right uh, yeah I don't yeah. know yeah Yeah, there's there's a lot of super, and then you go into the older public with the, oh, what was it? There was I think it wasn't there a super weapon in the Knights of the Old Republic game. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. That's beyond uh, my expertise. I didn't play that. I don't know. Uh, Sunraiser. Um, <laughs> awesome. I I thought there was. I never fully finished the uh, that game, and I played the older public, but I don't. I think there there is. A, there probably is a super weapon in that game. I, I, yeah, there's a plan of prison. The entire yeah, now that I think of it, the entire Jedi Knight storyline of the Old Republic MMO. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, there's like you go to these constant. You're going and like the first like act of the story, you're going from planet to pl- planet because the Sith have gotten their hands on Republic funded super weapons, and it's like super weapon after super weapon after super weapon that you have to try and make like, whether it's a uh, planet prison, which supercharged the upper atmosphere of a planet and turned the atmosphere into a uh, giant just fire, to a shock drum, which like just basically sh- like constantly is pounding the earth until the crust shatters. Huh. And then there's the 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 death mark laser, which um, is an orbital platform. And once you got like uh, you, you you could have it fire super concentrated enemy at a specific target. It was like a Death Star sniper rifle. Oh, that's insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the- and that's... Th- those are just all in the older public game. <laughs> and that's oh, not wow. even going to... Um, we have the Dark Reaper, the Death State. But then we get the Death Stars. Then we have the Eclipse, the Eye of Palpatine. I think my favorite of, the, of these names is the Galaxy Gun. I don't even remember that one. Oh, that might be the one that I'm talking about. That I think that was a um, a battle cruiser oh. that actually had a laser, just like a, you know, a Kyber laser, like the Death Star had built into it. It was a yeah, very it's... black ship. Yeah, yeah, it was from the Dark Empire comic, Dark Empire Two. Oh, oh yeah, uh, in that old, in that mm-hmm. like very original Dark Horse comic where. Um, Emperor Palpatine comes back as a clone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> got the, the giant gal. Yeah, that's a giant, giant missile. Um, and now we have um, another, I think the biggest of super weapons 
in the EU in Legends probably was like my opinion. I would other than I you know the Death Star one and Death Star two, I'd say it would be Center Point Station. That was built yeah. over. They always made a big deal about that. that was built in uh, Han Solo's home system uh, in Relia, mm. and oh, yeah. there was act there's there was a lot of EU stories that had to do with Center Point Station. I mean, the climax of the seventh novel and. Uh, uh, no, Legacy of the Force uh, theory it was they have to go on a rescue mission to save a princess from uh, <laughs> from inside the space station and then blow it up. And, <laughs> of you course. Know, of course. It was, <laughs> it was, it was in a soul that let that happen. So. But this is yeah. one of the things that I, I've been trying to argue with a lot of people, you know. A lot of people try and say, oh, they just redid, you know, episode four, A New Hope. They, you know, they just built a new Death Star and then they just blew it up. But you got to remember, this is the Empire and this is an offshoot of the Empire with uh, the First Order sent personally by Palpatine to the outer uh, outer uh, regions. And yeah. um, they, you know, if they have a weapon that is able to destroy an entire planet, it had a flaw in the first one which we found out was a purposeful flaw in the system. The second one was blown up because it was ill-prepared. It was battle-ready, but it was still ill-prepared to defend off the uh, the fleet that was sent after it. Well, yeah, and and Palpatine, he he made a gamble. Yeah, with his ego. he He led the rebels in to attack him because in his arrogance, he thought, oh, well, I'll lead him into this trap, send the fleet in. And then, you know, he didn't think they were actually going to pull it off because he had the shield generator. And he had his, you know, his allegiance to my best troops who's down on the planet. You know. <laughs> and they were taken stuff. out by teddy bears. <laughs> I'm not but a anyway. Sag, right? the entire um, legion. <laughs> but I think actually we're going to find out that those that legion of troops is not the uh, stormtroopers we're thinking of, but actually of the, the uh, Inferno squad. The ones I from mean, Battle yeah. Front. Yeah. Because we see too. them in the Battlefront trailer. Yeah. And they're getting a book out in July, so I'm I'm wondering if that's what he's referring to. Because but uh, my biggest be really nice. My yeah. biggest argument for this whole thing is is if the first order had these kind of plans to build something that could destroy an entire planet, and expand upon it to take out an entire system. Basically, what they did it's in the fine. Force Awakens is they finished exactly what uh, Palpatine was trying to do to begin with, which was destroy the Senate. Put the put the galaxy in chaos and then place it in his iron grip once and for yeah. all. There, here's a quote from J.J. Abrams on the similarities and differences between the Death Stars and Starkiller Base. Uh-huh. Um, and this is J.J. Abrams. Um, it was very much, and it's acknowledged as such in the movie, apparently another Death Star, but what it's capable of and how it works and what the threat is is far greater than what the Death Star could have done. Star Killer Base is another step forward, technologically speaking, in terms of power. And I like how he ter- how he, he phrases that. This is the next step. We have we've seen you know t- more more advanced Tie Fighters, you know more advanced X Wings and, and the Star Destroyers. Yeah, it's only a given. In th- this universe, they can create super weapon technology. If you're a government that wants to emulate an empire that had that was famous for making super weapon technology, aren't you going to make tech, uh, super weapon technology and move it forward and progress it to something the scale of a star killer base, a giant uh, planet with a gun fueled by the sun? I'm not exactly sure how it technically works. It's more like folds like space time with real time or something, or travels through hyperspace. Yeah. Um, Somehow. Yeah. It, yeah. It's one of those things that I, I want to learn more about. Like, we got all this cool stuff about like learning about the Death Star. Like, well, now I want to learn more about how they did Star Killer Base. Yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. I'm hoping that there's going to be more explanation about the entire First Order in coming books. Uh, oh yeah, I, yeah, I'd like with, to hear that too. With the Last Jedi, I think we're 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 going to see more, even in that film. Plus, the the journey to the Last Jedi publishing initiative is happening this fall. And we're going to be getting a full-length novel in uh, September called uh, Phasma. So oh, really? We'll really? Seeing, yep. So we'll be seeing uh, Captain Phasma 
story be told before um, The Last Jedi and before The Force Awakens. So that'll be really interesting. We'll be seeing more about how the... Well, I'm hoping to see more of, like, day-to-day stuff in the First Order and uh, hearing about how... Just how it kind of came to be. And Because she, she's part of the... According to the Star Wars Force Awakens visual guide, Phasma is a member of the... It was the... There's, like, an unofficial but kind of official triumvirate on Starkiller Base. Oh. It was between her, Hux, and Kylo Ren. Oh, okay. And I would That's love cool. to see how, you know, if Cat Phasma is as, like, big and strong and powerful that we thought that she was going to be in Force Awakens. You know, oh, yeah. because... Hold on. Yeah, we one thought, of these... Just a sec. We got one of these uh, speeders flying. Really oh, man, I don't know why these things are flying by so low. You know, it's the royal palace. You'd think they'd have, like, a no-fly zone around here. You think they would. Um, So, with with Phasma, because we we got introduced to her in The Force Awakens, we thought that, oh, she'll she'll be a total total badass. What's she going to do? And then... Yeah, I'll tell you what. My wife was so excited to see, finally, a female stormtrooper, one of her favorite things in movies ever. And then, uh, you know, she had like 10 minutes. But I understand she was a last-minute addition to the film. They didn't really get enough time to write her into the entire story. True. Um, yeah. But now that they're finally getting to flesh her out and this book is coming out, now that I know that, I know my wife's got a brand-new book to read this year, and then I get it secondhand. So. Oh, your, your wife will be even more excited, Lance, because Marvel is coming out with a Captain Phasma uh, miniseries as well. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic! Yep. Oh, that that I'm uh, gonna... mini... I'm it's, gonna it's have gonna to... be a four issue mini series uh, coming out in uh, September. Yeah. Uh, with a pap- paperback release coming out in November, and that comic is gonna tell how the story about how Phasma escapes the trash compactor on Starkiller Base. Oh, that's awesome! Good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, you know, when we get back to Earth, uh, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be uh, subscribing to Marvel Unlimited. I just have to do this. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly well, what's on the Unlimited part, but definitely the, the Marvel Star comics have been fantastic. Um, I'm still super way behind um, them. I I just buy them on Amazon when they come out on as the, the trade packs because it's, it's, they're super cheap. Never buy them in Barnes & Noble. You're paying arm and a leg for it. Yeah, I want to I wanna get the, uh, the Vader comics in the hardback, in the oversized hardback. I've been looking for that over here, but you can forget it over here in Europe. Uh, it's just way too yeah. much over here. In English, yeah, the Vader in English. Is, is fantastic. Um, and what's great is that in the, the very first issue, you get to see the ramifications of you know, Vader being the sole survivor of the Death Star being destroyed. And, you know, bringing this back to the Death Stars and super weapons. Um, the Death Star is one of those things that's been like, of all the types of vehicles and set location stuff that's one of the ones that has been like woven in and out of is the most mechanical mechanical stories canonical I guess that'd be the right word um then the Death Star I mean we see it in we see the plans with the Genosians and Attack of the Clones yeah we see it again the the skeletal structure of it in uh Revenge of the Sith but then we also in the Tarkin novel we see it on their set, uh, it's Harkins on Sentinel Base, and the novel actually ends with Death Star moving, like its engines are now fully operational, even though it's still not, it's not nearly as, not even nearly complete, um, and then the entire Catalyst novel is basically just, a, you know, almost like a biography of the creation of the Death Star, how we found out that you know, the somehow the Chancellor Palpatine got the plans for it, and that it was originally going to be a sup, uh, separatist weapon. Wait, really? That was in that was in which novel? Catalyst. Oh man! Oh wow! Yeah, it, it was fascinating because you find out that the during the Clone Wars, 
their the construction of the Death Star already had like they were already building it. They were going to build it to because Palpatine was saying that the Separatists were creating the super weapon, but we all know they probably weren't because you know, Palpatine was controlling both sides. He just wanted his empire to have it. True. True. Um, which means which the, means that. It, but that means that the Separatists were in control of Jin, er, uh, uh, Galen Erso because he basically designed a lot of it. And then Palpatine Galen, took it over. Actually, the, the weapon, according to Catalyst, Galen Erso is just in charge of the of, in charge of the crystals. Oh, okay. He's in charge of the, the weapon. The kyber gun. The, 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 the galaxy laser. gun, as, I, as we can call it. Okay. <laughs> um, no, the super laser. That's what Galen Erso is. Uh, he's a... Um, that's what his main field of expertise is in. Is, is he studies fiber crystals and all this stuff. With there is actually a, a delegation of Republic military um, officers and strategians and high up uh, political elites in the Republic that knew of the existence of the mobile battle station hmm. during the Clone Wars and. The they started construction on the uh, poles of it after Geonosius was captured in the second battle of it. So that being Clone War season two, when they kept, when Anakin and Kiati Mundi and all them when they retake Geonosis, that's when they start building it there. After uh, they retake okay. it, the Jedi knew nothing about it. Huh, that's insane. In fact. One of the main architects was a character from Clone Wars in the... You see him in the droids uh, arc. It was a... Uh, that little kind of squid-like guy um, who gave all the droids um, their kind of super power thing. Oh, I don't, I don't yeah. know. What the you guys remember the, the episode I'm talking about? I don't know. No... It was um, in Secret Weapons. Oh, oh, the the guy that upgraded all the droids. Yes. That Sorry. One? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was um, very odd. But by it was Master. That was Gaston was not him. Oh, who was it? Doctor Gubik. Gubiker. Gubaker. Gubaker. Yes, yeah, right. it was. He was a Parwin. One of those, uh, like, they, they look kind of like squiddy, kind of, I don't know. Um, there was one, another one of those Parwin species in the, the Bounty Hunter arc with Obi-Wan Kenobi where he has to infiltrate the that assassination plot. Yeah. Um, you, see, you see one of those, they have like three eyes and a lot of tentacles. They're really creepy things. But he was part of the, that Parwan was part of the, um, it was a designer for the um, strategic advisory cell that was a committee of many of the officials to uh, create the um, spe- the would be the Death Star then well it wasn't called the Death Star there's a lot of like different Star types Death. of these workshops and weapons <laughs> groups and it, it, it was it's Stardust all, like, we all know it was called Stardust yeah. <laughs> um, but we know so much about the Death Star, like, and then we see it again in um, the in Rogue One. We see more about it in Rogue One in the novelization. We actually see the chain of command that Galen did to reroute the thermal exhaust. Port. Yeah. Like if um, so, it's just really interesting, like uh, how much you know, lately they given to, to telling the story of the Death Star. I mean, even before the, you know, uh, the, the canon reset, there was a novel by me about, came out maybe 10, 10 or so years ago, and it was just called Death Star. And it was like, I don't know if you guys read this novel back no. in the day. It was a, about a bunch of different people that lived on it. And then it went, it was a concurrent with the New Hope. Mm. And it ended with, okay. you know, the the blowing up yeah. and then that one was just called Star Wars Death Star it was a really good novel um, 
the another real good like you see things on it was the star, uh, the novel Lost Stars. Did you guys ever read that one? Uh, I don't no. get time to read books, and finding books no. in English over here is impossible for me. I only well, just recently Lance, got Kindle. Uh, Lost Stars is written by the same author who wrote um, Star Wars Bloodline, that Princess Leia book. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm reading that uh, one right now. Yeah, it's it, it's one of the best Star Wars novels ever written. Canon Legend? Uh, canon. Oh, cool. Came out, it's a Journey to the Force Awakens book. Um, it it's awesome. There's a uh, character. It's about these two two lovers. One, they both join the Empire, but one of them defects, becomes a rebel. The other one's an officer, and it just it's really good. You get the beginning part. The the one main character, Thane, he actually witnesses the destruction of Alderaan from the Death Star. He's like a stor- a pilot there. Oh, and it's wow. just it's it's chilling because you get to see in his head of like, wait, what just happened? They just did that. <laughs> um, I couldn't even imagine and, I, everybody who was on the Death Star watching that happen. I couldn't even imagine the feelings that they were going through. Right. There had to be yeah, a lot I, of people that second guess their you know their position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure one they and, and if they did second guess it, I'm sure they didn't second guess it very loudly. No. Uh, well, you couldn't, could you? I mean, there there were probably a whole lot of spaceports, you know, you know, uh, uh, pressurized doors that all they had to do was just open up and get anybody who was questioning authority out of this, you know, the Death Star. Oh, you don't like it? <laughs> See ya. James, you need some uh, you need some sweetener with that tea. Yeah, I might. Uh, where the where that droid go? I don't know. I haven't seen it in a while. Oh, get him to bring this some. That'd be that'd be nice. I don't know. I, I you know I've been out of I've been out of my ale now for a while. But anyway, yeah, we'll get him back. I'm sure. Yeah. He'll be around. Maybe that reprogramming didn't take so well. <laughs> I need to. Need to tweak that a bit. Well, yeah, I mean the you know being in part of the empire is like right out of 1984, so they would be, uh, you know, looking for anyone who could be potentially a rebel sympathizer and all that. Um, but from the Lost Star novel, we learn more kind of like about like the day-to-day life on the Death Star, like how it had um, luxury uh, eateries and, and recreational places and. And like state of the art bartender droids and the cantinas there, so it really, you know, it was quite the happening place for the best of the best of the empire to be. Huh. Um, which kind of makes sense because when after Return of the Jedi with the destruction of Death Star Two and the, the main fleet there, you know, the empire lost its best when they were all on the Death Star or Vader's flagship or any one of the other like major. Star Destroyers there. So it makes sense that, you know, at following the destruction of that, you know, there's no real great leader because all of them are dead. Now, when we talk about the Death Star 1 and the Death Star 2, which most people actually refer to them as, um, now, we basically know that the first one, like you said earlier in the show, was 160 kilometers across. Now, Yep. It, what is that in miles? I got um, it here. So, so it's, it's 160. It's exactly 100 so, miles across. Yeah, about, a, yeah, about 100. Yeah. 99.4194. Yeah. And so now um, the difference... Be- and that had 1.2 million approximately people on it when it blew up. Yeah. That is a lot. But you got to remember, that's not just that's not just stormtroopers. That's also uh, support and everything else, maintenance. Oh yeah, that's and... that's that's everyone. All your janitors and all that stuff. But you know, as the Jay and Silent, uh, not Jay and Silent Bob, it was uh, fr- the guys from the Clerks movie. Yeah, Jay and they Silent. They said it best. Oh, no, Dante and Randall. Yeah. Yeah, Dante and Randall. Thank you. It's been so long since I've seen them. But you know, they say what well, went on the Death Star One was uh, you know. 
they're all Imperials, but when they blew up Death Star 2, those are contractors and construction men. <laughs> <laughs> that great dialogue. Yeah, that's one of the you know. that's one of the classic uh, conversations. And you know, I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan. And uh, if you don't, if you if you haven't listened to any of Kevin Smith's podcasts, check out his podcast, Fat Man on Batman, and uh, Hollywood Babylon. Check those things out. But um, yeah, those those conversations have been holding. They hold up. I mean, it's been twenty. Oh, they do. Right. Twenty five years now since that movie came out, and those people still talk about that exact same conversation because yeah. prior to that point, nobody really thought of that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because I, I, I have said it on the show before. I in summers when I'm home, I, I work at a gas station and I work the midnight shift. And I'll get, you know, my some regulars in, but I'll get this one guy in, comes in every once in a while, and we'll just stri- we'll just talk nerd stuff for, like, you know, 20 minutes or so, half <laughs> the, hour, this and gas whether it's Star Wars or Marvel stuff. And he had never, he'd never seen um, Clerks. So he comes in, you know, a few weeks, I, I mentioned Clerks to him, and then he, he never, he never heard of it or saw it. And then he comes in, and he's like, oh my god, I saw this movie. And the guys in that are like you and I, like talking, like you know, just talking shop about you know all this, this you know, nerdy stuff like that. And I'm like, oh yeah, Kevin Smith films are great. Yeah, they really are. I love them, even the, even the, the most recent ones. But anyway, but yeah, the, this conversation it really brings a point. It drives a point home because we were talking 1.2 million died on the first one. Uh, do we have an approximate number of how many people were? I guess present for the second destruction. Um, I think we had. Well, the crew on that one, as according to the great folks at Wikipedia, yeah, um, Imperial Navy and Army of crew was at six, um, six hundred and thirty-seven thousand eight hundred and thirty-five. Where they got that number from, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> they got that in Star Wars: Absolutely Everything You Need to Know, which was a book published in 2015 uh, part of the Journey to the Force Awakens initiative so alright well that's that after that is a Journey to the Force Awakens this. book yep so, so that's that... one of those ones uh, yeah that's a, I'd say that's an accurate number uh, that's, a, that's a canonical crew number yeah it's it seems pretty it seems pretty good because I mean the ship was only about what was it three quarters finished yeah I mean so. you still had both parts of the northern and southern hemisphere to be completed but then the bottom half the southern hemisphere needed a lot of the outer casing part to work but yeah. it was you know no. but I think to be fair I don't know exactly if they were going like what how if the Death Star 2 was going to look exactly like the Death Star 1 mm-hmm. or if the fact that it was still partially completed because you know again it's it's this whole idea of Palpatine's trap is it made to look that way to make it make, give you a false sense of security? Because when that laser goes off, it's like, oh crap, they just blew up a frigate. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. You know, one of the things that... Okay, never mind. I lost my train of thought. Just leave a blank spot. And I'll <laughs> that out. Okay. Um, oh, the Star Wars Absolutely Everything You Need to Know is uh, getting a updated and expanded uh, book coming out um, this November. Oh, that's that's cool. I gotta definitely yeah, check so, out for that. Yeah, do you, yeah. I get, get, find that on you'll find that on Amazon, Lance. That'll be your best. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a long story. It's customs and everything else with me. It's just I don't know. I think I'm on the customs blacklist or something. <laughs> it's my other hobby. I get metal detectors out of the United States from sponsors, and they come to about you know around two thousand dollars a piece. And so they see this big thing coming in, they make me go down and pay import taxes. So it's a long story. Wow, that that doesn't sound fun. No, it's not. Not at all. Especially when it's a free thing, I shouldn't be paying for, and I end up paying a couple hundred bucks for it. That's nice of them. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> now the the 
the one thing that now correct me if I'm wrong on the Death Star. Basically, only the outer casing of the Death Star is actually the only place where there's a habitation. The mm. inner portion is the generators, the generators, and um, the weapon systems, and the gravity fluxes, and huh. the sewages, and everything else. Is that correct? Uh, I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. Um, yeah, I don't know. A habitable crust, according to um, this would be the sorry, two. Okay, so C Catalyst wrote one novel says a habitable crust of several kilometers thick was composed of command centers, armories, maintenance blocks, and other requirements for a fully operational space station. Unused stories in the station's lower levels held backup weapons, operators, and the event of an emergency. Levels in the station's southern hemisphere extended downward through armories, deep storage, in a southern command sector. Massive gr um, gridders provided grid-like support to the lower levels. Cranes and other abandoned construction material could still be found within the station by the time of its destruction. Oh, really? So, yeah. Uh, fig well, we figure if this thing is 160 kilometers wide, several kilometers inward on both for the habitation part, there's a good chunk that's not habitable. I mean, you still have the reactor core yeah, yeah. and everything on that. All the weapons I mean, God, system. The, the I'd, I'd, ha I'd hate to be the guy living in like the apartment right below or even around the laser dish that just be unsettling I guarantee I guarantee directly above that dish was Palpatine's personal office just oh I'm so sure if he had a there. spot on there or, or Tarkin's little little room and he'd be like yeah this is where I want to be well, but... Palpatine would have made sure his office was on the bottom of the dish yeah no yours sure. is on the bottom <laughs> mine's on top now go away piss off um, and the station's attention block, while large and formidable, was not intended to hold prisoners for extended periods of time, and instead it served as a place for temporary detention and interrogation, pending transfer to planetary prisons. Sort of like uh, the uh, Wobani prison camp that we see in Rogue One, that yeah. kind of a thing. Or uh, Keshik is a constant prison planet after the Empire has taken it over because oh. of with all the Wookiee slaves. And the Wookiees, I believe, were a... At least in Legends, they used the Wookiee slaves to build the Death Star and yeah, other that's, types of yeah. alien that's, that's another one of the things, because if you, if you listen to Rebels, uh, they basically... Or, I guess you could say the aftermath of Rebels. Basically, it was the Geonosians who were building the Death Star, but in the Legends, it was the Wookiee slaves who were building the Death Star. And now, yeah. recently, I've heard that both were involved in it. Yeah, I mean, well, it could be that they, they constructed what they could construct in Geonosis, and then when they were done, they are like, well, we don't want to keep this quiet. We want to keep, the we keep this quiet. So then they just killed all the bugs. Yeah, gassed them um, as we found Which out. I actually kind of like. I thought that was. I mean, I don't, I'm not. I, I I don't like the idea. Well, I mean, I think it's cool, and I never would have thought like, oh, they would have done that to Genosis. But like, you know, when you watch like Attack of the Clones, and you realize like, yeah, these guys. By the time of A New Hope, these guys are all dead. Mm -hmm. you know, except for one. Kind of makes it. Except for one. And but the, well, actually, and the egg queen. She, well, she gets. If, if, if that queen, if the egg becomes the queen that we think she becomes, uh, Vader kills her shortly after A New Hope. Oh, wow. Canonical. Canonical, yep, that's in the Darth Vader comic. Oh, okay. See, mm. see, okay. I need to read these. So, yeah, we're talking about this huge orb that has tens of thousands of lasers on it. Laser cannons, laser turrets... Ion cannons, just about everything that you can think of that could basically hyperspace through the entire galaxy, go to wherever it needs to go, direct itself above a planet, which I'm pretty sure as soon as it orbits itself above a planet, the gravitational forces on that planet go a little cattywampus. And, I'm sure. And, um, yeah, 
and then it just has the ability to just completely wipe you out if they want or just to pinpoint as we've seen in Rogue One certain areas on the planet yeah it's just a complete doomsday super weapon just right. to annihilate life on any type of enemy enemy planet and this thing, if I remember right, it has, I think it's, I think it's around two or three hundred TIE fighter bays on it. And then, and, and having all these, plus, I don't even know how many, you know, prisoner decks, which kind of makes it kind of interesting that, you know, uh, Luke, Han, and Chewie, and Obi-Wan just happened to land in the one you know, the one hangar bay and be able to find the one detention cell that's holding Princess Leia. Um, yeah, it's, you know, the will of the force, as I, I just call it that. <laughs> I guess. Because, uh, yeah. you know, plot for, for, or, you know, they really don't say how long they, they went and they do go on that elevator. They never say how long that elevator ride took. Exactly. That's true. I mean, if we we can kind of speculate, and I hate to cross paths here, but it could be a turbo lift. I mean, I'm pretty sure that this thing goes a lot faster, you know, kind of like probably some kind of a light speed within the place that can get from one side of the Death Star to the other side of the Death Star super fast. They, they utilize the same type of technology that the Japanese have on their, like, super bullet trains. <laughs> But they're like bullet elevators. But still, we're talking. We're still talking. That's not. About... Can, that's not. That's not canon. Oh, I don't, I'm just. I'm just making guesses. Yeah, but even even if we, even if you take that in, into consideration, that it's going, let's say, 320 kilometers an hour, it still take half an hour to get to the other side of the Death Star. You know what I'm True. saying? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, except that, that you know that kilometer talk you're using. Yeah. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> I live in Europe. I drive kilometers the right way. There's only three countries in the world that still use miles per hour. <laughs> True. Yes. But you know, it's funny, actually. Star Wars tends to use kilometers, but there actually is an in instance in um, Clone Wars where they use the word mile. Really? I didn't even notice. Really? Yeah. This, this is that. this this is why you guys have me on the show because I yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. like you know, <laughs> who, like seriously, who who the hell knows when they use the phrase "mile" in a, sh but no, they use it in uh, a in uh, the Clone Wars. Aelis Sakura says our ship crashed a few miles away, and one of us is badly injured, and. Um, you also, uh, and there's the G again back to Geonosis. Their catacombs were, they said, were several miles long, but wow. almost every other time they ever mentioned it, like <laughs> measurements of distance, it's always in kilometers. Wait, was that was that? Did did they actually refer to these uh, the catacombs? If I remember right, I think in Rebels they actually say these catacombs go on for miles and miles. They could be in any direction. I well. I just I'm, I'm just looking looking this up on Wikipedia because I want to make sure that I'm right on this, um, and I, I I am. They, it was in Jedi Crash and Legacy of Terror from Clone Wars, and it was in Adventures in the Wild Space: The Escape, which is a young adult novel that came out a few months ago. Um, they apparently miles were not referenced in Rebels, so okay, okay. maybe so. I guess that was Ezra just saying these things go on forever in every yeah. direction. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't commit he wasn't committing to one form of one unit of measurement to another. But we all know which one Ezra would use. He'd use the mile. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's from Lothal. Maybe Lothal oh, and miles are bigger. Now this is just funny because now I'm down this rabbit hole. Oh no. Um, of. Star Wars measures of uni units and the miles used in Legends um, it appeared to be roughly the same as a Chiss Visva which I don't even know I, oh, I've never that's the 
I, I, I don't I, I don't even I've never heard of that one either. But yeah. I clicked it, and it's the that's the chis form of measurement, which is the same as a mile. <laughs> okay. It's different, but it's not a mile. Um, <laughs> but those old Marvel Star Wars comics mention use the phrase mile in them. So. Uh. There you go. That's that's the information you're you're talking, find you're here talking on all the old the, listeners. That's true. Which which old Star Wars? The we're, old we're, Marvel ones, right? Uh, yeah. It, Empire Strikes Back. We're big big mile fans. We had uh, Star Wars number 42, 43, 44. Empire Strikes Back to be a Jedi. Betrayal at Bespin and Duel at Dark War. Mention Miles. Now, this is funny because. It says, you know, Wikipedia, this is, again, I'm sorry, listeners, this is a real big tangent we got going on here. Um, Miles, they're mentioned in 55 Pit and 74, the Escolan effect, but in the Empire Strikes Back, when you apparently Miles make an appearance and not just be mentioned. Which I find that really funny. Like, how did how do you how does a mile show up on screen right. without being mentioned? I don't know. I don't know. Would you like any refreshments? Well, the droid finally showed up. Uh, James, you want another tea? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, we were on the. Uh, we were basically talking about how long it would take to travel from one side of the Death Star to the other. So they had to have some sort of super transportation that was in there. Let's say you needed to get from gun battery 1 to gun battery 2617 on the other side of the Death Star. There had to be some way to get across. So that's why I'm thinking there had to be some kind of a light speed uh, version of an elevator shaft that went vertical, horizontal, you know, in basically three dimensional space. Uh, Or it could be like Willy Wonka's glass elevator. Uh, or Doctor Who's TARDIS. Well, I'm oh, just saying because uh, Willy Wonka's elevator goes in space in that sequel. Yeah, well, Doctor <laughs> Who's TARDIS goes in space. That's equal too. Uh, are we gonna have Willy a word off Willy now? Wonka's cool. <laughs> are you kidding me? Bow ties are cool. What? <laughs> hey, where are, are we, we about to have here? a nerd off now? <laughs> Doctor Who versus Once the Death Star. No, I'm not going to go there. We all know who'd win. That Death Star would just rip him to shreds. Um, You'd have to figure out where and when he was first. But anyway, I'm that's not true. I'm not a doc, that's a <laughs> Doctor Who. That's a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, there has to be some kind of super transportation inside the place because you can't get from one side of the to the other without some kind of a super transport if there's an emergency on one side or the other. they got to be able to get crew, backup, stormtroopers, and everything else from one side to the other super fast. So that's that's where we kind of went on that tangent. Hey, hold up, guys. Hold up, guys. i got a transmission coming in. It looks like it's coming from the Tatooine sector. Oh, this is a, this is a transmission I sent to us earlier uh, in the week. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to this real quick and uh, see exactly what we brought to us. I know what it is. Well, this is Lance. Uh, I'm butting in into this episode with a very special guest. Uh, he's been described as a comedian who never grew up. I personally say he's one of the few comedians who does uh, no holds barred stand up comedy still. He's listed religiously as a midichlorianist, which is kind of uh, something that we might actually get into. He has appeared in exactly 12 episodes of the podcast, Doug Loves Movies, so far. Is that, is that right? Yeah. It's, but I cut you off 12? That feels like more. Are you sure it's only been 12? I think I think what, the last time this was updated, it was 12, and then he just came on two weeks ago, so that was 13 oh. now. I feel like I've done it like dozens of times. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be more than 12. Huh? Maybe it is. Maybe it is 12. That, there's the wiki for that. Huh? I'm sorry yeah, to cut, to cut exactly, off the intro. Exactly, yeah. But I, I, never had, I never looked into that or thought about how many times I've done it. That's well, you're thing. listed at number 34 as far as the most winning people with a 24% average. 24%? No, this is off. I win more than 24% of the time. Come on. <laughs> I, 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 I like always win. <laughs> what the heck? 
<laughs> okay, I gotta get into this later. <laughs> uh, and Doug refers to him oftentimes as a prequel apologist. He's written for the in, uh, the television show NBA Fashion with Pat O'Brien. He's now currently writing for Problematic with his great friend Moshe Kasher. He's appeared in the film Down and Dirty with Jim Norton and even has his own short-lived yet hilarious YouTube series, The Seer Ovs of Santa Monica, which was 10 episodes long. I'd like to introduce you guys to one of my favorite comedians, Jacob Seeroff. All right. Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. There was so much, uh, so much of that was incorrect, but like I had not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Things you were reading off IMDb and like old Facebook stuff. And, really? I thought that was really that was really entertaining for me to listen to. Don't cut it out. <laughs> the, the, my favorite was the movie Down and Dirty, which I'm known, the TV series I was cut off of. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so you're not even in the movie either? Not in the movie or the TV series. No, but I'm on the MDB page, which is all that counts. <laughs> it, this had to be added by them to just kind of give you a ribbing or something, wasn't it? Uh, no, I think it's more just because there was, they had already submitted the oh. list, you know, the cast list or the, the, you know, the talent list to IMDb and never bothered to take it down. But, hey, I'm glad it's still up there because, you know, I need all I can get. But you are still currently uh, writing for Problematic, right? Actually, I'm not currently on the show, but I did, that was, I did write for Problematic and that was recently. But I, I, I wrote on the show for a few weeks uh, and then left to go write on another show in New York for a little while. And now I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, one of your listeners will give me a, another job. <laughs> well, you know, uh, can we talk about the other show yet? Oh, yeah. It's just a show called uh, Comedy Knockout on True TV in, here in America. It's, are, are you, I don't know. You're in, you're in Germany, yes? I'm, I live in Germany. I myself. But, I'm ex-military state over here in Germany, but okay. uh, most of our listeners are all in the United States. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's a show on True TV called Comedy Knockout. It's kind of a game show with comedians, you know, competing with, it's not it's like they hate they hate to say at midnight so i shouldn't even say that but uh it's you know kind of a mix between at midnight and with like a more roasty kind of feel but it's it's really fun they got great comics it was a great writing staff great people work on the show it was a really fun experience yeah that's and great. i think that's those start those new, it's there was they've had a bunch air already and i think these that we shot 16 uh episodes on this run and i think they start airing really soon actually so check that out but, Wait, so but you, but you were saying I was one of the few last comedians in the world or something like that? Yeah, one of the <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you're saying the best and last last of the best one of the one of the, one of the last no holds barred stand up comedians. Yeah. Basically everything is there's no such thing as taboo when, when you get up on stage. That's true, and um you see how far it's got me. <laughs> I'm doing this show. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to kind of bring us into this. Um, now, one of the first things I always ask anybody that came onto the show was, what was your introduction into the Star Wars universe? Um, interesting. So I'm going to just go ahead and date myself because I'm going to assume that nobody that can hurt my career is listening. But so I'm, I will be, I was a month shy of two years old when A New Hope was first released. And uh, I remember seeing that for the first time, I believe, on the on the television debut. I don't know what age I would have been, but it had to have been, what was that? Do you remember? It must have been like 79 I think it was, or 80. I think it was I think the, 80 that it actually aired. Was it on ABC or was it, it was on network television? And it must have been in, you know, in preparation for the release of uh, Empire. Now, I don't remember if I saw because I remember when they, they were, I know there were re-releases of A New Hope, before, you know, leading up to Empire, where they actually slapped the episode four on the crawl and everything. Yeah. Um, and I I can't remember, I was so young, if, if I saw that theatrically. I want to say I did, but that might just be in a memory I've invented. But I absolutely, at five years old, my father took my brother and I to see Empire. And I just, you know, to this day, I have memory. Actually, at the at a theater in San Francisco called the Empire Theater, and uh, coincidentally, <laughs> in West Portal. And I remember just like, being so elated and, and just overwhelmed by how cool it was. And, you know, of course, everything in five years old is overwhelming, yeah, but, uh, you know, just like whispering at questions, who's that, what is, what is that guy, what's he talking about? And it just, that, that really, um, I mean, it really had a big effect on me. It, it was that time frame, and we yeah. went into the theater. Alien was 79, by the way, I just looked it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it makes totally sense, because I remember, I think, because it's funny that, it's a, but it's, to your, you know, to a Star Wars point, I, that just shows the impact that Star Wars had because, you know, Alien clearly isn't a Star Wars ripoff. It's a, it's a horror film, but the idea that that was even, let's, you know, there were studios and, you know, filmmakers were just clamoring for like, what can we do in space on spaceships yeah. just to like, capitalize on the Star Wars thing? So, you know, obviously Alien's a brilliant film and, and all it owes to 
Star Wars is its space setting, but even like the look of the ships and the way that we see kind of dirty ships and people kind of sitting, you know, the way that they interact, it's like a darker horror version of, you know, the Star, of Star Wars. And, you know, that's a direct result of, you know, they're just, that wasn't like a popular, you know, it's hard to imagine for kids now that like outer space, you know, that wasn't a popular blockbuster setting for a film, you know, until Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. And prior to and that, anything... Pirates and Space Raiders, all these movies that came out after, and even, they even, uh, sorry, I keep cutting you off. No. I'm going to say that, like, at this point out, then I'm going to let you talk. But I remember even, I'm a big James uh, Bond nerd also. I remember, uh, well, I don't remember, but in, in studying those films, if you watched the, 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 in 1977, they released The Spy Who Loved Me, which was, I think, maybe my favorite Bond movie with Roger Moore. And at the, remember, at the end of the Bond movies, and now, nowadays it just says James Bond will return. But it used to actually say James Bond will return in, you know, The Spy Who Loved Me, or he'll yeah. return in yeah. Octopus. It would say the name of the film, the, the next film. And I remember at the end of uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, it says James Bond will return in For Your Eyes Only. That was in 77. Then that same year Star Wars blows up. And they, the next movie they release is Moonraker. Moonraker. Now, if you read the the book of Moonraker, it has nothing to do with outer space. Moonraker is a Russian nuclear missile, and it's all it takes place in the White Cliffs of Dover in England. And but they, so it, you know, I just they were so starving for space stuff. They're like, okay, well, there's an Ian Fleming book with the title with the, has the word moon in it. <laughs> that sounds spacey. <laughs> Let's take that, put it in outer space. And it was you know, it was kind of a mess of a Bond movie. Although I love it, it has its moments, but it's very poorly reviewed. And then at the end of Moonraker, it actually says for the second time, second film in a row, James Bond will return. In the Spy Who Loved Me, which uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in For Your Eyes Only, which actually was released in in '81. But it's, you know, Star Wars just affected everything. Everybody was just it was everything was just space and lasers. Now, one of the things that I've always heard every time I listen to Douglas movies, and one of the things that really pisses me off the most, and uh, you know, for uh, I'm not actually there, so I don't know how the atmosphere is in the room, but he always refers to you as a prequels apologist. Doug hates me. He's always bullying me physically. <laughs> he slaps me around in the green room before every show. No, no, it doesn't. There's no, I don't think there's any, any uh, actual ill will when he says that. And it may, although maybe he does it to antagonize me a little. I, but he hates the prequels as do a, you know, a lot of people. And um, that's something I encounter all the time. People call me a prequel apologist. And I know the word apologist is kind of just colloquial for, someone that really likes something that other people don't like, but I don't, I always maintain that uh, I'm not a prequel apologist because there's nothing for which to apologize. So I'm, you know, I'm a prequel defender or, or uh, a prequel lover. Yeah, exactly. And, and I completely prequel love it too, as they say in the South. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a little Let's bit. Yeah. We haven't talked to, so you're, I assumed you were, yeah, if that bothers you, I'm assuming I could assume that you were. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm one I think of those... they're perfect. I think they're beautiful perfect misunderstood films i literally would not change a frame of them and you know nor would i even you know would i think it was my place if offered to change you know someone else's art but uh, in the way other people seem to want it but uh I, it's not that i feel like oh come on give them a chance i just look at them and i think these are perfect how do people not see it at least once or twice a week i get in a conversation with someone and they have very detailed reasons why they why they don't like the movies i i also something that's not been popular for me to say is uh, or people hasn't been received well. Is I think a lot of the there's a sort of herd mentality that contributes to a lot of the prequel hating. Yeah, and certainly there are people that hate it with good reason and can back up their hate. And, but even, still, there's this there's just this. It's hard to be the guy to stand up and say uh, that you like something that is just so condemned by the by the masses. But I, um, you know, I also get accused of being a contrarian a lot as a result. Just you say it just that people people tell me I say it just to be different or to make people upset. But when I'm alone in my little apartment watching the prequels by myself, you know, there's nobody there to be to impress. And I'm, I'm not faking my my getting choked up at the Qui-Gon scenes and stuff. So. Yeah. And I don't think you'd go out and get a Jar Jar tattoo on your arm just because, you know, you want to try and make a point. Well, people, I could see the argument that I would if I was just on some Steve-O, you know, kind of right, Johnny yeah. Knox, that thing, you know, just to be a jackass. People get tattooed, <laughs> like I have shitty tattoos that I've done on purpose, but not, not, you know, that's, the Jar Jar tattoo is a, a but you're right, it's sincere. It's not ironic at all. No, it's, uh, it's a beautiful but It's also, tattoo. it's my stand for like, my Jar Jar love, like, I like Jar Jar, I support him. He's not, it's not like I watch, it's not like he's my favorite character in Star Wars, although I think he's really important and I do dig him, but it's the mass, you know, the onslaught of hate towards him that makes me want to defend him more. So it's like, if I'm going to get a, you know, a, an episode, a prequel era tattoo, like that's, that's the one, I mean, that's the symbol of my, you know, of 
it's something that I appreciate that everyone else hates. Also, just yeah, I feel like it's an anti-bullying thing statement yeah. at this point. Yeah, and I I totally stand with you on the Jar Jar thing. I think Jar Jar is a very misunderstood character. Um, a yeah. lot of people fail to realize that if Qui Gon Jinn and Obi Wan Kenobi had not met Jar Jar any of the following films, including episode four or five and six would not have even happened. Right. I like that. I like that. Of course they hate that. That's what people, I think maybe realize that and hate that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the point you're right in that the point is that there's a point to Jar Jar that people miss. And I almost, and I've said before uh, that I, I feel like maybe because George Lucas, maybe he did too good a job because the whole point of Jar Jar is he's supposed to be annoying and you're supposed exactly. to hate him, you know? Yeah. And when, and, but, you know, the, there's this idea, this message to Jar Jar that even the most annoying, useless-seeming uh, life forms can serve some greater purpose in the grand scheme of things. And you know, th by the time that, that pans out and comes to fruition in the films, people just hate him because he's annoying, Yeah, which, exactly. is, you know, which he was designed to be. It even comes up at one point in uh, The Phantom Menace when Obi-Wan just says, let's just leave him, and Qui-Gon's like, no, we'll take him with you. Oh, you mean what he said? Uh, this Gungan may be of use. Yeah, but one of the things, if they had not met uh, Jar Jar Binks to begin with, they would not have met Padme. Uh, they would not have crash-landed on Tatooine. Um, Jar Jar would not have been elected to the Senate, and um, you know Palpatine would have never been elected into as the Supreme Chancellor. Yeah, sure. And yeah, I mean, everything I mean, ties. Just within the first movie, I mean, also, you kind of, I mean, I know, you, you kind of skipped the part where they need, the whole point, they need Jar Jar to, to, to you know to, to find the Gungan, the Gungan army which fights army. the, the yeah. battle droids which you know distracts so the Jedi can go capture the Viceroy mm -hmm. and the, you know and fight Darth Maul and or the Queen can get the Viceroy and the Jedi can fight Darth Maul and all you know, all all that stuff is because of, you know and there's this whole you know there's that moment where Padme puts it together when she's talking to Jar Jar and Coruscant before they leave and she's kind of like wait you got you say you got a big army and he's like yeah that's why you guys don't like us and, and then <laughs> she's put it together in her head like you know uh, I see. I see the plan here. And, you know, that's supposed to be the force at work and bringing people together, you know, that seem, that seem the useless life forms together. But, you know, again, the counter to all that is as someone that doesn't like those movies could just say, yeah, I understand, Lance, what you're saying. All that is true, but I hate all that. <laughs> you know, just hate that he made, I hate that George Lucas made that part of Star Wars that episode four couldn't happen without Jar Jar doing all these silly things leading to it. I don't feel that way, but you know, I can see like when I watch Rogue One, a movie that I didn't care for very much. It's okay, but I have a lot of problems. The more I think about it, the more I don't like it. And uh, when I watch Episode Four nowadays, although I haven't watched it since I've watched Rogue One, I'm not gonna. I don't look at it. I'm not gonna watch a movie in my mind. There's there's not a hole in, in the, the Death Star, a flaw in the, the Death Star design because Jin Erso's dad put it there out of guilt or frustrates me. Like no, nobody has my opinion. And even the people that like are like, really like the people that have been semi-supportive of the prequels and George Lucas, there's always some kind of jab slipped in that makes me just want to choke, you know, reach to the screen or and choke somebody. And I just, I just really don't read fan theories or it's fine. Like yeah, it's my whole Star Wars world has changed since the sale. Like I don't really go on the Fortinet. I you know I used to, used to be it still is my homepage, but I used to just consume Star Wars news every day. And now you know I just feel like since George is gone, it's it just it's not it's not the same for me. So yeah, I don't think that James you know JJ Abrams is fine. It's just I I have so many I I like the Force Awakens a lot. I lo actually I love the Force Awakens, but I just have so many problems with their approach and and uh, and just. You know, even if and it doesn't matter, they could be perfect. If it's not from his brain, it's it's not dogma for me. The way that I look at Disney Star Wars, like, you know, there's parts of it I like, parts of it I don't like, but I kind of don't include it in my Star Wars, you know, in my major, my Star Wars thought process. And I think that, you know, the average Star Wars fan these days, or people that would call themselves Star Wars fans, would be the, the you know, kind of the opposite. Everybody agrees the originals are amazing. Nobody's disputing that. No. And then, so, but then those people kind of embrace this new Disney Star Wars, this new canon is like, okay, now, now I'm, I'm back into it. And then with the prequels, they think, well, you know, Darth Maul was cool, but I don't, I, tr I try not to think too much about those movies, you know? And I guess that's like, that's my approach with new Star Wars. Right now, mm -hmm. um, the guy in charge of Disney said that this movie could go on, or these series can go on for another three. Um, but uh, that's it, and then they're gonna say it's done, and then they're just, they're just gonna do the, the Star Wars story, the anthology films, or whatever. I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I think Disney was why, gonna keep why it. wouldn't they just keep making episode 27, episode 29? Yeah. Like, I don't know what those stories would be, but it'd be stupid not to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Now they bought it, 
Yeah, it's, I'm sure they already made their money back, and plus amusement parks and merchandise. They don't, they don't. Well, did what they buy it for? Four billion? I bet they've four made point, four billion four, on Star four, Wars already. Four point five billion dollars. Yeah, I bet they've made that on Star Wars already. I Just guarantee it. Just the two films that they've already released. I just, guarantee. Yeah, the two films plus released. merchandising, and then you know just. What, God, when the Disney park opens, that's going to be awesome. Oh, I can't wait. And you're right there, too. I'm right there, yeah. <laughs> I haven't even been on Hyperspace Mountain yet. The end of the really? chain Space Mountain, I haven't gone. I'm trying to go soon. I just got to sneak I got to sneak over when, you know, when the kids aren't there. Yeah. So I can't afford to, I can't afford to take them. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to find some day to go to Disneyland without the kids. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no I, I really wanted that. That's what this is. This is your, this is your time. Um, yeah, okay. but people like, uh, like you had already been saying, people are always talking about, about the, the prequels episodes. One, can you hurry this up? It's my time. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the point. Get to the question already. So You're the, cutting uh, out on my time. <laughs> you're a true blooded fan, uh, fan for every one of the six films, but what is the one thing that irks you the most and uh, really pisses you off about what people say about the prequels? Yeah, 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 that's a tough. It's God. That's it's so. That's a that's a tough one. Um, no, I know Jar Jar. Anything uh, against Jar Jar? Well, is there on you? no, it's not that specific. You know, there, there's something that bothers me when people say they hate the CG. I think that's a big one because nobody complains about the. It's the best possible CG you can do. It's ILM who's doing, and these, you know, the. I'm sure ILM did all the Marvel stuff. I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not to speak out of my ass, but it's, I would assume they did, or a lot of it, and. Um, Oh, uh, so there's this idea that like I don't like it because of the CG and the and but nobody complains about the CG in the Matrix or nobody complains about the CG in you know the Avengers. Every, Hulk looks just as much like a cartoon as anything. Yeah. But you know we, yeah. we and it's there's this idea that like models and miniatures and stuff are a better version of fake. Like it's all fake. It's all a you know representation of a fake. You know, a, you know it's a fictional representation. You know of something happening in a fantastical world. That we can't, you know, it's it's not going to look, you know, real. So just choose your fake. But this whole idea that people are so freaked, nobody complains about things looking digital, uh, like they do about the prequels, and that's it's like some weird excuse to hate them. So yeah. I guess that bothers me. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I know. And it really exactly. bothers me in the new movies how they go anti-digital, like to to for nostalgic purposes. And when you see in Force Awakens, when you see these kind of like big puppety things in either uh, you know Maz's castle or in uh, you know on uh it's fucking Jakku, uh, like the you know the big thing drinking out of the water when yeah. Finn pushes Finn out, you know, right before Finn sees Ray for the first time. It's like, you know, when Lucas used things like that, it's because that was the best available technology to make a creature, you know, some alien creature at the time. And so the idea, he never went backwards technologically. Every Star Wars movie pushes, all of his movies push the envelope technologically and innovate technolo- technology that was used in subsequent, you know, non-Star Wars films, but. He never, and you know, that's part of people to a fault, and people would say because he goes back and tries to fix the special editions or take out the wolf guy or whatever. But, um, because you know, he want you know, in his mind, he wanted to do better than that. But, uh, purposefully using archaic effects for the sake of nostalgia is just so anti Star Wars and anti George Lucas to me, and that really bothers me about all the new stuff. Mm. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. See you know, and a friend actually made that, another. Friend who does he a, a guy who's probably even more hardcore than me because he's as much of a prequel George Lucas lover as I am and he loves d- all this Disney stuff just as much <laughs> like he is just full embrace he embraces everything he's not like bitter at all about the new stuff and um but he said something about the Force Awakens you know, just it, it, it didn't it didn't push technology in any way film technology and George always did that yeah he definitely did uh, you definitely see it I mean he waited well, so when Matt, long and when Matt, I'm sorry when Mad Max won all the Force Awakens Oscars I didn't feel I felt like yeah that was that was a better more original you know movie special effects wise than the Force Awakens was because they were they were building puppets and trying to make everything look you know like practical effects instead of just doing the best the coolest possible things you could do which is what George tried to do sorry mm. go on no 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 I totally yeah, agree no, you can have some of my time you can have some of my time <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you, Jacob, um, for coming on to the show. Uh, where can people see you? This will be coming out on next Monday. So where can people see you coming up? Um, I were, like I got some Doug stuff coming up, but I'm not allowed to say. Okay, that's Doug, fine. Yeah, just, I know. Just, just God, he likes to keep the guests so secret. But, yeah. you know, go, everybody in America, go see Doug Benson shows, and I might pop up and do a Doug Loves Movies or a stand-up show with Doug. 
And um, my friend Kasim Bentley and I are pushing this uh, duo act we do, and that's you know uh, just we'll be seen at various bars around Los Angeles. And uh, I'm trying to think if I have anything else to push really. Does everybody watch Problematic? We want, we want more episodes so I can you know yeah. uh, potentially work there again, or even if I don't work there again. And that's over on good, True TV. Good no, that's on Comedy Central. It's Comedy Central. That's Moshe's show, and that should you know it's a great show, and it, you know. One of the more unique shows on television. They should, they should. I'd like to say, see it stay on, and also uh, comedy knockout on True TV. Okay, that's the one on True Watch TV. For Kyle, Watch for Kyle Kinane's Jew joke. I wrote that. I was very proud of it. <laughs> All right, definitely going to keep an eye out for that. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show, Jacob. Um, if you ever have time in the future, we'd love to get you back onto the show. Sure. And, sure. Thanks for having me. I hope that you that I said something useful, or that if anyone's heard me talk Star Wars before, I probably. I've said most of this stuff other places, but you know, if it's somebody's uh, introduction to me and my silly uh, Star Wars opinions, then welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your opinions are what really drove me toward you on Douglas movies, and uh, that's one of the things that I reached out to you for, and I couldn't be more happy to have you on the show. Oh, thanks. That means a lot. I really appreciate you having me. It's fun. All right. Fun so, so that'll do it for us. Make sure you check him out on True TV and Comedy Central. And uh, until next time, Jacob, we'll see you around. All right. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we just got back from our interview with Jacob Sirup, and um, there was a whole lot of panic, and you can hear behind me that all the sounds of the screams and people running all over the place. Uh, there's people running in panic. Um, something has just appeared above the planet. It's a really large object. Uh, James and John just ran off down the hall to see if they can get a closer look. Uh, somewhere in the palace, I believe, there's a telescopic lens, and they're going to all try and take a look at exactly what this is. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we know exactly what this is that just showed up. Uh, it's currently floating somewhere above the planet, but it's huge. It's actually starting to uh, move in front of the sun as we speak. And um, you can see people just running in panic all over the place. Uh, there are speeders taking off all over. And um, there are spaceships, uh, some, some shuttles actually taking off. And some, some other spaceships down at the, uh, the, the ports are actually starting to take off now. And uh, people are still just running in panic. Uh, if this is exactly what we think it is, uh, this is not a good sign. This is kind of an ominous presence, and it is currently flooding above us. Uh, slowly, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the sky, and we're just kind of sitting here staring at this. Uh, James and John are uh, gone. I'm going to sit here with uh, my last ale that I just got and uh, just kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Oh, man, this thing is absolutely immense. It is huge. It is now currently sitting above the planet. Uh, people are just going absolutely insane, running left and right behind me. Uh, this palace, which was once just a peaceful place, and the only thing that you get is every once in a while a speeder flying overhead and a couple birds. It's just now uh, all the servants and the crew and everybody else just running in panic. Um, now, I see, I see the, uh, I see Queen Bria and Bail Organa now heading toward their, their shuttle down below. Um, they're currently running, and they've got their personal armed escorts uh, right behind them. Uh, but, uh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be some kind of a light originating from the Death Star. Uh, this, I guarantee, this is exactly what I'm looking at right now, ladies and gentlemen. And it is this really brilliant green light that is currently coming toward me, and it is... And transmission. This has been a production of the Fulcrum Podcast Network. Be sure to check out the other great Fulcrum Podcasts. There is another podcast and the Bucket Cast.